critical access in rural hospitals. So a lot of credentials there. So I think we're all looking forward to hearing all you have to tell us about uh, telehealth policy. Thanks. I, I think probably the best way to describe who I am is that um, I am a telehealth ninja. I, I love this. <laughs> I think we all need to be ninjas in this field and, uh, and to be able to show the kind of uh, leadership uh, to be champions for telehealth. Um, the the one uh, factor that I think out of, out of all those that I'm um, most proud about is being a rural advocate for the last 30 years. Um, I've lived in Sacramento area uh, for the last 20, uh, and so when I came to Little Rock uh, for the first time, actually, in, my, um, in all my travels, um, I felt like I was getting off uh, in Sacramento. It, it's, it has such a feel to it with the river, the trees, uh, the rural countryside, and I think that's a battle that, that we in rural California face a lot, is that um, the image of our state is really, for a lot of people, um, this weird place called Los Angeles way down in the south. Um, but, um, you know, over 13 percent of the population, 80 percent of the state is rural, uh, and uh, some of the areas up in the far north uh, could be anywhere from three to four hours of a drive to get to a specialist. So it's been quite a challenge, uh, and I've been working in the telehealth field now for a good 20 years uh, with uh, my work at the endowment to begin to uh, make it available to safety net providers uh, to provide the services and training. Um, and uh, actually a precursor to some of the federal dollars uh, that have, have come in. So what I'm going to be talking about today is, is our um, current um, policy issues and hopefully some of the, the, uh, the policy changes that we're seeing in the horizon at the state and federal level. So a few words about the center. Uh, we've been uh, in business since 2009. It was created through a grant from the California Healthcare Foundation. We we're fortunate enough in California to have a, a foundation that was created out of a conversion of a uh, not-for-profit health plan that uh, converted to for-profit, uh, and um, with that uh, endowed two foundations, the California Endowment, where I worked uh, for 12 years, and the California Healthcare Foundation, which was endowed with about a billion dollars, uh, to develop policy that would help the, uh, to provide leadership and, uh, and um, uh, support and financial support to be able to transform the healthcare delivery systems. Um, their vision, and Dr. Tom Nesbitt, who was our founder, uh, has been a real champion of telehealth in California and nationally, uh, felt that we needed a place uh, in the state that would have an exclusive focus on technology-enabled healthcare, that uh, he could see that the world of telehealth and, and healthcare reform were going to be on a uh, collision course of sorts, and that um, the the opportunities for making healthcare accessible and um, and at a re at reasonable cost, and to be able to take advantage of the changes in technology, were going to be there. But the legislation and the laws that were in the books were um, uh, antiquated, if not uh, you know, inappropriate, for the needs of uh, 20, 2012 or, or twenty ten when we started our work. We also. Um, conduct research and analysis. We're an independent nonprofit center, so uh, we shy away from any funding from uh, the industry, uh, and our goal is to help to develop uh, credible evidence that can be used to advance uh, policy for telehealth in all of its forms. Um, we've done a number of studies that you'll see on our website, uh, one on, the, on a telederm project that was uh, uh, to assess to what extent uh, Teladerm was being used by dermatologists in California once we made it available through Storm Forward. Uh, and we just completed a study that was part of our um, efforts to get legislation passed, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, that um, projected the cost or the cost savings to the state of almost a billion dollars to the use of remote patient monitoring uh, for just for patients with congestive heart failure uh, in uh, non-acute facilities. So that's the kind of uh, work that we do to be able to, to, to build the kind of evidence that would convince policymakers uh, and advocates uh, and provide ammunition for the advocates to be able to make change. And we also provide advice and guidance. We have a, an 800 number so that as uh, people are getting into the field of telehealth and they have questions, uh, that we can advise them and direct them in the right places uh, for uh, that information. Uh, in, 2000, I guess last year, uh, it's, it seems like it's been longer than that, but it's only been six months, uh, we were awarded a grant from the federal government under the Office of the Advancement of Telehealth 
to be the National Telehealth Policy Resource Center. Uh, and this is building on our work as a policy research center in California and where a lot of our work became known nationally. Uh, we support, our primary objective is to support the work of the 12 uh, 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 resource centers, the TRCs as are noted around the country, um, and uh, South Central here is one of those. And um, our primary goal is to, is to be able to provide technical assistance, support, uh, and, um, and be a place to inform, but also to be informed uh, so that we can make connections across the board uh, through the 12 resource centers around the country so that we can build the body of evidence to advance telehealth um, where most of the action these days is going to be at the state level. Uh, there's also another national resource center which is based in, uh, in Anchorage, Alaska, which is the center uh, that provides uh, free technical assistance in the area of the, te the technology side. Uh, and so we work in, uh, in partnership with them, and, and uh, if you're not aware of these centers, you should uh, certainly connect with them. So what about telehealth? I think this is, uh, this is a field, as we, as we heard this morning and, uh, and, uh, and in conversations in the hallway, uh, that um, has a lot of, a lot of questions. And, and when it comes to policy, if you're a provider, if you're a payer, if you're a medical center, uh, and you're interested in telehealth, getting into it is, is a challenge. Um, there's a lack of information about what the reimbursement uh, rules are. The cost uh, is uh, really hard to get a handle on. Um, what's the return on my investment? Uh, how do I integrate it into, into the services, and how are my patients going to, to uh, respond to all this? Um, so um, just recently, actually, the, uh, uh, the Institute of Medicine, um, conducted a, a session in which they brought together some of the, ex, the greatest experts in the, around the country uh, to address this whole issue, you know, the role of telehealth in an evolving healthcare environment. And we spent two days uh, with a number of panels uh, from both uh, federal bureaucrats as well as from universities and from practitioners uh, going through the various aspects of telehealth and what some of the challenges are that uh, to be able to advance telehealth. And I can tell you after two days, and you can download this report from the uh, IOM website, uh, we know um, a little, just a little bit more than we knew before going in. Uh, and probably more questions were, at, were left unanswered than, than were answered in that process. Uh, one of the, the, the most obvious things that uh, was, was a bit frustrating is that we all know that in many instances telehealth is very effective. It's effective in, re in reducing costs, effective in improving quality, certainly in reducing access to care, particularly in rural, remote areas. What we don't know um, is how much do we really save with telemedicine and telehealth. Uh, there's, uh, there are a lot of uh, different studies out there, uh, but the, the problem is that the technology in the, in the field is changing so dramatically uh, just in the last five years that to be able to have any kind of comparative studies has been very difficult. There are also uh, a number of, of uh, what we would call unintended benefits, as we heard earlier, uh, that are resulting from this. Uh, just the savings to a family that lives in a rural community, not having to travel, taking days off from work, uh, the ability to, uh, to preserve communities, um, preserve the, uh, the life of a rural hospital, to create jobs. These are all factors that never really get into the equation of the congressional office uh, the budget office to determine what they call their markers for uh, for cost versus benefit. So there's a lot of work to do in this field in terms of being able to develop the evidence um, beyond quality and access uh, to determine uh, how we can actually really save costs. And I'll get into that in a little bit. So um, this may seem a bit basic for this group, uh, but it always is important for me when I talk about telehealth, and I, and I do use telehealth uh, purposefully. Um, the field evolved out of telemedicine, um, but we know that telehealth, uh, that the field actually includes many aspects of healthcare, uh, dental care, mental health, behavioral health, um, uh, health in the schools, uh, population health. Uh, so we're, we're beginning to see uh, the benefits of this of this technology uh, affecting all aspects of health care. And so in every instance, I try to encourage the use of telehealth or at least the use of telemedicine and telehealth, particularly when we're talking about changing public policy. Uh, defining telehealth uh, from the beginning in legislation 
uh, to provide the umbrella of what we consider to be telehealth uh, is extremely important uh, because uh, what we have in the books, and I'll talk about this later on, in many, many states, most states, in fact, only refer to video, uh, live video conferencing. And so um, as this field evolves, we have seen the benefits of, of other aspects of telehealth. Um, certainly live video has been very successful with, uh, with psychiatric care, with uh, uh, neurology, uh, other aspects that we've heard about. Um, but store and forward is, uh, is a fast-growing area of telehealth that, um, and in this case, we're showing a, a demonstration of a, of a um, tele-ophthalmology uh, and using retinopathy to evaluate, uh, in, in this case, it's a rural, remote uh, uh, Native American health center uh, for patients with diabetes uh, to be able to determine if there's been any, any damage to their retina, um, particularly important with women um, where it's associated with heart disease. They do not have to travel hours and hours to a, to a health center to get that examination. They can do that in their neighborhood, in their communities, uh, in their tribal lands. Um, this is an example where those, those uh, um, evaluations are batched and sent through a secure electronic uh, email uh, to a specialist, and they can evaluate very quickly. And it also makes the specialist much more efficient. Um, um, in the case of dermatology, for example, the dermatologist can now work at a higher end of his profession or her profession uh, to be able to see in their uh, in their face-to-face uh, -face encounters the patients that really need to be seen. Uh, and so the 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 moles and the, uh, the lesions that are suspicious that the primary care provider in a rural health center or in a even even in an urban uh, underserved area uh, can now have that consultation through this uh, through uh, store and forward to be able to determine whether or not they need to be seen in person. The third major aspect of this is remote patient monitoring. As we heard this, uh, one of the questions this morning about the aging population uh, and how uh, uh, health really happens at home. Uh, and so more and more we're seeing the technology moving to uh, the use of applications and, uh, and digital uh, assessments uh, that allow people to stay at home, not to be institutionalized, uh, and, um, and it covers the whole spectrum, everything from tele-intensive uh, care units, tele-ICU, as we heard uh, from Mississippi, uh, to the emergency rooms, uh, to uh, uh, all aspects of, of being able to, to monitor patients in a non-acute situation, uh, particularly around chronic diseases. Those are all important aspects of this, including uh, public health services uh, and population health, which is another uh, emerging area, particularly around disaster relief and things of that nature. A fourth area which um, um, I'm now talking about more in the, in the definition of telehealth um, has to do with uh, this whole field of mobile health. Um, our jewelry for the future is going to be all of these different devices that we can wear on our wristwatches and our you know, pulse optometry in your ear, language escalators. Um, it's incredible the kinds of technology that, that is emerging that can monitor people um, to, from the you know, prevention perspective and wellness uh, to those who have uh, multiple uh, <coughs> chronic diseases, particularly um, patients who are over 80 in, in, a, uh, in a nursing home situation. Um, so, um, and I, you know, this looks like the future, but I was just uh, admiring a friend of mine happened to have a very interesting looking wristwatch, and it happened to be, you know, the new smartphone that you can now wear on your, on your uh, on your wrist and can monitor your blood pressure and uh, any number of other things. So the world has come. This is not the future. It's now. So a little bit more about, the, about why telehealth and its importance. Uh, we heard a lot this morning about that, um, uh, and I think uh, I want to just reiterate a few points. Uh, this is uh, what we call the, you know, it's more than a perfect storm. It's a, it's a storm that's here of increasing demand for the newly insured with the uh, um, Affordable Care Act and the millions of people who will be insured, um, the uh, shortage of primary care providers uh, that will never be able to meet the demand, as, as uh, it's been emphasized earlier, and all that leading to the rising cost in health care. I would add a couple of more points to this. Uh, that I think that are, are factors that, that affect all three of these, and that is the aging population. Um, as we boomers uh, become, um, you know, more and more um, uh, chronic disease uh, prevalent and, and uh, um, moving into the, you know, the aging at home and, and uh, long-term care facilities, the cost, as we all know, 
is, uh, is going to be significantly higher. There's also the, 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 the persistent problem of persistent poverty, uh, the diseases of poverty, so obesity, hypertension, diabetes, uh, that um, seem to be present um, throughout all of our uh, poor rural communities um, are going to have a dramatic effect as A, as they grow older, and B, as they become newly insured. So when you consider all these issues together, um, telehealth becomes more than just a, um, uh, a, a nice flashy new tool, but it's going to become, I think, a, an essential part of healthcare. To be able to get there, we need to think differently. And uh, moving away from the fee-for-service model uh, to a, a model that is based on um, improving the health care, improving the health outcomes of individuals, the quality of care, and reducing costs. Uh, this is the new federal policy for the AAA uh, and the goal of uh, the health care reform movement over the next 10 to 20 years is to move from a system that is about keeping um, uh, more about the services, the more services, the more fees, uh, to one that it's about keeping, um, uh, it's about the person and the costs associated with the delivery of care and to increase its efficiency to increase its quality, uh, and to ultimately increase the, uh, the better outcomes that will happen. And I think one of our goals at the center uh, is to be able to, again, as I mentioned earlier, is to provide that evidence. Uh, these three factors have to be working in combination. Uh, and telehealth, uh, in any talk that I give, no matter whether it's about the cost of care, improving care, there is a place that you can find telehealth uh, and its benefits and make, and make a very convincing argument. Um, on its benefits to the, to the future of healthcare delivery. So I talked earlier about uh, the vision that we had <coughs> at the at the uh, center and its creation um, to address the issues of of uh, transforming the legislation that existed. Uh, in 1996, under the leadership of of uh, uh, Dr. Nesbitt and others in California, and then with uh, uh, then State Senator Mike Thompson. Uh, the first major comprehensive piece of legislation in the country was passed in 1996 to uh, provide the framework for defining telemedicine at that point and to define the conditions under which it would be uh, reimbursed uh, and who can provide telehealth. Um, when we formed the center, our first ch challenge and charge uh, from the foundation was how are we going to be able to exist in the future with this uh, legislation that no longer is relevant to the, to the needs of the communities moving forward. Um, so um, a topic for another presentation would be, you know, to go into great detail on how we were able to uh, develop the coalition uh, and get this legislation passed. But uh, some of the key elements that are important to, to, to keep in mind um, is that we, one, did our, did our homework uh, and did research and looked at uh, where, where are other statutes around the country that we can look to as promising practices. Two, we pulled together a model statute work group um, of some of the best thinkers in the country uh, to, to be able to advise us on areas around financing, on, on uh, um, workforce, on settings, uh, and to help craft the language of what we call the California model statute. Uh, that can then be taken by the advocates for, uh, for possible legislation. And then we produced that and we made ourselves available as a resource to the state legislature and to the governor's office and Department of Health for questions related to um, um, the, the model statute. So we can't lobby uh, as a nonprofit and we certainly want to maintain our nonpartisanship, but we can be informed experts in the field uh, to be able to advance the, the laws. So the key elements of the model statute report, and there's copies in the uh, packets that I handed out. Um, uh, one is to, as I mentioned earlier, define telemedicine as telehealth, and including the three major categories that, uh, that I mentioned of uh, live video, uh, remote patient monitoring, and remote uh, uh, and um, uh, asynchronous uh, store and forward. We also defined uh, who can provide telehealth. In the, in the 1996 legislation, uh, telehealth was only defined to a very small um, uh, group of uh, physicians and other kinds of providers. Now, under new legislation, anyone who is a healthcare professional is qualified to provide telehealth. It also removed a number of requirements that were imposed onto our Medicaid program 
that you had to, the, the provider, the onus was on the provider to demonstrate that no other uh, alternative existed uh, before they could bill on telehealth. They had to achieve a written consent from the patient beyond um, the normal uh, consent, uh, treating this as a, some kind of experimental uh, form of, of health care, uh, and a number of other kinds of requirements that just seemed silly uh, in 2010. Uh, so those were removed. Um, it also created parity. Um, uh, we sought to create parity. We were not successful in achieving what Mississippi's done, which is, uh, I think, important, and that is to get equal pay for whether it's in person uh, or in um, through telehealth, but that was one of the recommendations that came out of the report. Uh, promotes telehealth as a uh, as a tool that improves healthcare delivery. In essence, it's a tool of healthcare as opposed to something different. It's a modality uh, that that any um, any healthcare setting should use as appropriate. Um, creating more flexibility, and um, then became the blueprint of legislation. Um, by producing this report, we were then able to take it to uh, the California. Um, uh, state Rural Health Association, to the California uh, Primary Care Association, to the Hospital Association, to the, to the Medical Association, the Nursing Association, all the interested groups, uh, and be able to educate them on what the proposed model statute should look like. Uh, and then formed a coalition of, of advocates that we facilitated. We didn't advocate for the pieces, but we certainly were there to, to answer questions. Uh, and were able to then um, and I think this is uh, critically important in the politics of today is to, is to get uh, bipartisan author authorship where we had a very conservative uh, Republican from the far north rural areas as an author and then a young um, uh, progressive activist uh, Democrat from down in Southern California jointly sponsored the bill. Uh, and then we worked with the committees uh, and our coalition to answer all the questions that came up uh, and in the end, we were able to get the bill passed without a single vote of opposition uh, and signed by the governor. Uh, so a lot of that was luck, um, but, but it also was a lot of hard work and having champions. I think this notion of ninja is really important. It does take a champion to be able to move forward. And as we heard in Mississippi, that's what it uh, took to get them to, to that point with their recent legislation. The other thing that I, that I think it's important to emphasize with our um, – uh, efforts with um, uh, expanding telehealth is the location. We need to get it out of the healthcare delivery system, um, or out of the medical care delivery system, excuse me, out of the four walls of a clinic to include places like homebound patients, skilled nursing, schools, regional centers, prisons, uh, emergency services, uh, and our primary care networks. Uh, telehealth needs to be available everywhere where people live and where people work. So a few words on federal telepolicy, uh, telehealth policy. Um, Medicare is, um, is, is living in a whole nother century. Uh, the, the laws that govern Medicare uh, specific to telehealth are, um, are inappropriate and, at a, and, and just uh, create, a, very, they create a, a difficult situation for states that want to change their legislation because they're looking to the feds uh, for guidance. Um, so they only reimburse in the Part B. They're limited to live video, uh, only in an in-person encounter, so none of the other three elements that I mentioned. And it can only occur in a, the most um, narrow definition of rule. So even the National Rural Health Association uh, believes that this is an anti-rural um, component of Medicare, that uh, we should not have any kind of restrictions at all on Medicare and its use uh, in the delivery of care to our aging population. Um, <clears throat> so what about Medicaid? So here's where all the action, I think, is going to be in the next uh, five years. States have great flexibility, particularly now with the changes in the health care reform and as states sign on for expanded Medicaid, uh, whether it's privatized like uh, here in Arkansas or in other places um, or run by the state, opportunities exist now to, to uh, create legislation uh, to move forward and incorporate telehealth into um, whatever system is being uh, developed. So when um, we first got this grant from the feds to become the National uh, Rural Health uh, Policy Center, um, Telehealth Policy Center, the first thing that we looked at was, okay, so what are the laws and regulations that exist that govern the delivery of telehealth in the 50 states? Where can we find that information? 
And as you probably all know, it doesn't exist. Uh, there are little bits here and little bits there, but there's no comprehensive place where you can go and say, what's the, the latest in Tennessee? What's the latest in Arkansas? What's the latest in California? Uh, so we can begin to see, it, particularly as a provider, as a payer, um, before you even get into telehealth, uh, you want to know what the what the rules are that, that govern your, your work. So um, I told my staff, this is your first charge, and um, uh, they've hated me ever since because it, it was an intense six months of work to go and comb through every single Medicaid manual uh, that uh, all 50 states and to use um, services like LexisNexis to see what legislation is actually in the books. But it's done. Uh, we released it uh, just last month. Uh, and um, it's now actually available on our new website. Uh, we will have we have an interactive map uh, in which you can click on any state, and you can determine um, um, both by by looking at a state to see what their laws and regulations are, or if you just want to see what states have legislation that uh, uh, allows for stored forward, you can search through through a particular category. Um, these are the, 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 the key areas that we looked at in the 50-state report. Um, so more than uh, we were very much interested in see how telehealth was being defined. Uh, also, um, the uh, who gets reimbursed for telehealth, whether they allow for email, phone, and fax. Was there any kind of written consent or, or robo, uh, royal consent? Uh, are the limits on the location where it could be provided? Uh, issues around facility fees, online prescribing payer laws, licensing, those are the, the key categories that, we, that you can actually search on in our site. Here's the good news. Every part of this country except for um, crusty New Englanders um, uh, up there in the, in the far north and Iowa for some reason uh, don't have any, any um, legislation or any rules or regulations governing telehealth. That could be a good thing. Uh, the fact that they don't have anything means that there's a lot of flexibility, um, but it's also one in which you can, you can have a lot of uh, restrictions. The interesting and I would say even more kind of craziness of all this is that no two states are alike uh, and that the rules and regulations um, come out of some very strange different perspectives um, that have been on the books for a long time and, it's, and I've been getting calls from folks saying that they, they didn't even know that was on the books. Uh, that, that were passed in, in forms of legislation given their states. So just to highlight a few things here, um, uh, 20, uh, the 41 states actually have a definition, um, but four states don't have any, any, state, any uh, statutes that govern their, their Medicaid reimbursements. Um, 17 states have no definition. Um, Utah has two different definitions, one for the one in legislation uh, called digital health services, and but their me their Medicaid manual uses different references, uh, and as you can see, um, there are just any number of combinations and and such around um, how telehealth is is being defined. So some of our conclusions, um, I'll just hi highlight a few in the interest of time here. But um, uh, state policies, um, uh, essentially, the bottom line is um, most states are not ready for the implementation of the Affordable Care Act because their state laws and regulations and their Medicaid manuals are not, um, uh, are not adequate enough to define and utilize telehealth to its maximum. So we are strongly um, encouraging and part of our work over the next year will be to help uh, to inform other states on model pieces of legislation and how to go about um, uh, developing uh, model statutes. So uh, for one example is that we're going to be using Mississippi's latest law and we'll put it on our website uh, so that other folks can see the language that they used uh, and be able to contact Chrissy if they need to get more information. Um, in terms of utilization, um, this has clearly been the theme of this conference so far. We're not even scratching the surface of the utilization of telehealth, particularly around remote patient monitoring and, um, and other aspects that, uh, um, with, with asynchronous and, and mobile health. So there need to be incentives for using this. The federal government has created incentives around meaningful use and electronic medical records. Uh, that has really shifted the way um, uh, providers now collect that information and store it, but we have no incentives for the diagnostic side of the, of the equation. Um, and then the impact on others, as I said, without federal government leadership, uh, it's going to be really difficult in an uphill battle to get states to move forward and change their laws. So we're working at the federal level to, 
incrementally uh, achieve some changes. But as you know, it takes an act of Congress to, to change. So just a few words about your, your area here in terms of the, the three states. Um, Arkansas, is, um, and this may not be news to all of you, but I thought it was interesting. Um, it's defined in your Medicaid manual as uh, only real time, so only uh, live video is allowed. Um, I thought this was interesting, that Medicaid will reimburse for only up to two visits per year. I don't know if that's being, re I don't know if it's being enforced, but that's what it's, what's in the law. Um, telepsychiatry can only be reimbursed through your uh, telehealth network. Um, and uh, the electronic trans uh, transactions have to occur within an office visit as part of, of the patient visit. But there's uh, this, this other little language there which I found interesting, which says x-rays and other diagnostic procedures may qualify for Medicaid reimbursement. So there's a big loophole there um, that I think that can be utilized. Uh, there's legislation um, that just uh, was passed this past, past month that looked very specifically at changing uh, the definition of a telepractice only for language pathology, speech pathology, and audiology. Mississippi is now a star. Uh, they're leading the country in, uh, in being able to um, uh, get legislation, uh, at least in terms of live video, uh, that would allow for um, uh, equal reimbursement. Um, but it also has this very interesting language. It, it, hopefully this was uh, removed as part of your recent legislation, but it excludes the practice of telemedicine through postal or courier services. I don't know if they were thinking they were going to be using pigeons or, or whatever, <laughs> but it's, it's in the law. It's in, the, in, the, in their statute. Um, and there must be a, a physician-to-patient relationship um, established. Um, so as we know, they just recently passed SB 2209 and was signed by the governor just, uh, just recently. So um, we now have 17 states that have equal uh, reimbursement. Tennessee is way behind. Um, uh, there's no definition in statute. Uh, the only reference that we could find for coverage of, was in coverage of mental health services through the Medicaid uh, 10 care manual. Um, they will reimburse for live video in crisis-related situations, uh, but the patient must be informed and given the option of a live um, assessment uh, in person um, at the time of the, uh, of the, of the delivery of care. Um, and, and, and on the opposite end of things, they actually have the most liberal rules when it comes to allowing physicians uh, from other states to provide telehealth consultation in their state. Uh, the only pending legislation that we could find um, was to, to mirror uh, similar language that was in the Mississippi legislation, uh, and hopefully this, this will also be passed in Tennessee uh, for equal reimbursement uh, for live or, or telehealth. So uh, as I mentioned, um, it takes an act of Congress to change the Medicare laws and uh, the Center for Medicaid and, and Medicare um, uh, to be able to, to to be able to move their legislation and their um, their laws and regulations to to address the demand of the future, um, there are several pieces of legislation that have been introduced. This uh, S five ninety six um, by Tune from Minnesota, um, which would establish pilot projects to provide uh, remote patient monitoring in home health agencies. Um, it's a very well written piece of, of legislation. However, it has gone down in flames four years in a row um, and has little chance of passage this year. Um, same thing with H.R. 541 by ESHU, which defines um, uh, very specific language related to high-risk pregnancies. That's also been introduced several times and has not gotten anywhere. Uh, there is actually a, um, a new bill that is uh, being considered um, it was introduced, uh, interestingly enough, by, by uh, Congressman Thompson, who was the author of the California legislation, um, that is a comprehensive bill that would redefine uh, how telehealth gets, gets uh, 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 delivered under federal programs, removes the, uh, the rural uh, barrier. It also requires payment for telehealth services uh, through the federal employment plans, um, eliminates any limitations on store and forward in Medicare, and removes the, the rule limitations, as I said. So I think this is a, um, one of those kinds of bills that was, was introduced on the last day of the session uh, to get it out there, to get a reaction, uh, because obviously it's not going to be passed, 
and there's some consideration that there may be uh, that he may introduce different pieces of this. Uh, and just this last couple of days, I learned from our own congressperson in the Sacramento region, uh, Doris Matsui, that she is considering introducing a bill that would actually define telehealth and provide a much broader framework to allow for the kinds of things that we are promoting uh, through the use of telehealth and improving access to care. Um, so a few more words on the Affordable Care Act and, and the, the, the policy changes. Um, we heard a little bit about the patient center in Oklahoma. This is uh, one of the versions of the Accountable, um, or the Afford or the Accountable uh, Care Act, uh, Affordable um, what is it, ACOs, um, uh, that uh, allows for bundled payments and moves toward the model of creating value. This is a model that I think is the model of the future. Um, uh, I think that uh, the particularly for rural communities, it looks like, like four, you know, like a house with four walls, but in fact, the medical home um, has much broader uh, spread in terms of its, of its connections. Um, the use of telehealth and connecting the practice organization, information technology, the quality, your quality measures for evidence-based medicine, uh, the kinds of algorithms that are going to be needed to be able to expand care are going to be uh, um, critical parts of how you make a, um, a medical home successful. Um, it also is the key to teams working together. Uh, healthcare is moving from the individual provider, physician, uh, to the creation of healthcare teams, the use of nurse practitioners, um, outreach workers, uh, medical assistants, uh, incorporating mental, dental, social, uh, all part of healthcare. Um, the key to success for all this to work is through the connections uh, through technology. Um, so we think that uh, th that the stars have aligned, and I think in the sense that what we have in terms of the, uh, the, the uh, encouragement from the federal legislation, that here is a model that allows for, um, it's good for the payers, it's good for the employers, increases efficiencies, increases quality, and most importantly, increases access for those who don't have care. Uh, just a few words on, on our future challenges. Um, the use of, of, um, of non-traditional providers, uh, I think, is going to be um, part of the, uh, a growing part of the debate moving forward, uh, standalone nurse practitioner clinics. Um, but being able to use the primary care physician at the top of their field to be used most efficiently when they're in a rural community or an underserved community, um, to be able to have the kind of network with uh, extended uh, providers in uh, other areas uh, more than just 40 miles, as the laws call for in, in uh, I think Mississippi, but uh, anywhere in the state uh, where the services can be provided is going to be critically important. Um, also, the, what telehealth does to a healthcare system is is, is disruptive. Um, you know, our, we did a demonstration program with with the um, uh, Safety Net FQAC clinics in California. We had 40 clinics um, through the funds of the Healthcare Foundation were offered free. Uh, consultation for specialty care from the five um, UC medical centers, which are the top medical centers in the state. Uh, and they subsidized the UC medical um, centers to be able to encourage them to provide the care. We provided them free equipment, free training, uh, and did everything except lead them to the, the provider. And it took a long time for the systems to be able to adapt and adjust, uh, to develop new forms of training for the providers new forms of trainings for, you know, creating new, new staff like a telehealth coordinator, which didn't exist before. How do we do our scheduling where a physician is booked, you know, from 8 in the morning to 7 at night to be able to take a half an hour out to sit in a telehealth console? Uh, a lot of things that we learned out of this, uh, which we're going to be producing in a, in a, a brief uh, later on uh, in the spring, um, uh, have taught us that we need to be thinking very differently about the kind of healthcare workforce. Developing, there was a, a question earlier today which I thought was spot on. Um, telehealth is liberating. We no longer are bound by these invisible uh, geopolitical boundaries uh, of states, that we have the ability to create the kinds of, of um, regional networks that can allow for um, uh, services across state lines and to be able to create more efficiencies in the delivery of care. We need to be moving more to evidence-based medicine. Uh, I think that um, being able to connect uh, your telehealth technology to the electronic medical record to produce the kinds of reports, not just for accountability of the dollars spent or 
uh, reimbursement, but to, to get a better sense of the trends. Are there more diabetics than there were last year? Um, are there more kids? Are there less kids? Um, how are we dealing with, with new problems that emerge? All of that comes out of, uh, out of the, um, the ability to connect our, uh, our services through, uh, through the uh, technology. And new reimbursement models. Um, I think that um, we're going to be seeing more and more of that. Um, I'm very curious to see what happens here in Arkansas and possibly in, uh, in Tennessee with, uh, with the privatization of Medicaid. I think it's, uh, um, it's intriguing. It also has its risks and its pitfalls in terms of assuring uh, adequacy of care and delivery of care. Um, one of the benefits of the bundling of care in a, in a medical home is that the costs associated with um, both the, uh, the hardware and the training and the services and the personnel for telehealth can be bundled into those payments. So it is liberating in that sense, but will there be incentives to do that in a privatized kind of environment? So those all, I think, are important issues. And I think also the, this whole issue of interoperability is going to continue to be a, 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 a concern. Um, uh, Epic in the, in the Mississippi model uh, is integrated um, in a more vertical system, but in other places you have many different kinds of electronic medical records uh, they can't speak to each other. So we, we've had situations where uh, in this demonstration project where we have um, the, the services being provided by the, by the community health center through the latest technology in telehealth with the best specialists in the state, and yet they still have to fax the records back and forth. It just makes no sense at all. So these are, these are kind of the issues. And those are the issues around mobile health. Um, uh, these issues tend to be more about um, the ethics uh, of what's appropriate uh, in terms of privacy, uh, in terms of access to information, and also uh, controlling information. Um, we are, we're now going to be overwhelmed with data from patients through the use of these different kind of applications in mobile health. Who manages it that? Who, uh, uh, who determines what's actionable? Uh, what if, uh, if information comes in um, that is uh, it's not being monitored appropriately? What's the what are the liabilities associated with that? What are the liabilities of not using telehealth uh, when it's available uh, and would increase the benefits of healthcare? So we're going to be seeing a lot more of these kinds of legal ethical questions emerging. So I think with that, um, uh, I'll stop. Uh, this is our new website. We're very proud of this. We just launched it um, uh, April 1st this past week. Um, and so on this website, we have um, essential information about what I covered here in, in the um, in, in my presentation, but we're going to be tracking very carefully legislation uh, that is occurring in different parts of the country. Uh, we'll make sure that we include those um, on our website, and we will highlight different, um, uh, both model practices, uh, such as the ANGELS program, which we intend to include in our, as part of our um, uh, uh, national website, and also be a, be a repository so that the regions and the leaders in different regions will have a place to go to see where there is uh, advancements in telehealth. Um, so with that, I'll stop and take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've got about 15 minutes left or so for uh, any questions. I think if you've got a question, you can come to this microphone here in the middle, and uh, that way everyone can hear the question and then the answer that goes with it. Um, meanwhile, I'll go ahead and have a question that occurred to me. You, you talked about a little bit the ACA and how that's, you know, going to transform care and, and the medical home and ACOs specifically. Is, do you know of any examples where people are using telemedicine to kind of coordinate that care between the medical home and specialists throughout? I mean, are people starting to really incorporate that into that model? Um, in um, only limited isolated cases uh, that I've seen where that's, it's actually being incorporated, um, it's, it, it's um, I think as was mentioned earlier, I think that's it's inevitable that you're going to be able to see that. Um, the project that we've worked with in California is uh, Open Door Community Health Center, uh, which is in the far north of California. They cover uh, two counties the size of the state of Connecticut. Uh, so they have seven clinics, um, very mountainous uh, coastal area, very isolated from the rest of the state. Um, they have been real leaders in the use of telehealth and the creation of of a uh, FQHC that um, in that community is not just a safety net provider, but they're the provider of choice of the community. So they are the, um, the main place where people go for their primary care, regardless of their, of their income. Great. 
But I think that's that's an issue that we're going to right? uh, we need to figure out what are going to be the incentives to to create that, and who's going to you know, and it, and it starts with the payer. It starts with the money uh, to be able to ensure that uh, that that can happen. Um, another thing, I'm, of course, anyway, feel free to jump in on <laughs> But I just, uh, while I got you here, um, you know, one of the Bring them on. <laughs> questions that, you know, it seems like we, we kind of wrestle with sometimes, it's maybe kind of esoteric, but there's kind of this debate of, you know, is, is telemedicine, should it be its own discipline, or is it, should it just be a tool that's part of regular medicine and, and not focused on as being kind of this separate entity? So I'd be curious to get your thoughts on, on that's that. That's a softball. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think um, that is part of the, the perception change that needs to happen. Telehealth, uh, telemedicine, um, however we describe it, is a modality of delivery of care. It's a tool that's available to a provider to enhance and, and strengthen and, and, and improve the quality of the care being provided when it's appropriate. And so to the extent that people see it as something separate that requires a written consent from a patient to utilize it as, a, as if it was dangerous or experimental or even second-class care. Um, or even in the debate I had, I was just recently in a, um, in a briefing with Senate staffers and some of the, um, the policy folks from CMS, and we were talking about Medicare. And the, the, it finally occurred to the, um, to the bureaucrat from Medicare, from CMS, as we were talking about this, that what we're describing is telehealth as a modality of delivery of care. It's not a, a separate service. Yet the, the way the whole billing system is oriented, uh, at least in Medicare, is that you bill for certain kinds of services that qualify under Medicare, and only a, only a very limited few number of things can be, can be paid for. So I think this is, this is a goal of the American Telemedicine Association, of the National Rural Health Association, of other groups that are advocating um, for um, the use of technology in healthcare, that it, it becomes an integral part and in that we reach a point in the future where it's not even an issue that, that's, that's brought up as something separate, that it becomes part of the delivery of healthcare as appropriate. Have you seen um, any, any impact on the sequester on, you know, telemedicine, specifically HRSA or any, anything like that? Is, is there any kind of worry that that's going to cut any funding on... on issues that pertain to, to the telemedicine community? Um, just a lot of fear, a lot of concern. Um, uh, there's, there's, there's so many unknowns with that at this point that it's hard to say. So I, I think it's, it's an area in which uh, we are um, we're going to be monitoring very carefully, but I think that it, the, 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 I think the important part of your question that I'd, I'd like to leave you with is the federal government is going to do very little to change the laws and the regulations governing, governing telehealth. They may work around the fringes. Uh, they may create some demonstration of pro or pilot projects. But where the real action is going to be is at the state. So I encourage all of you who are ninjas um, to find the champions and create the kinds of coalitions and develop the kinds of model legislation at the state level uh, that can then allow for um, the the, the kind of reimbursement systems and coverage systems that, uh, regardless of whether it's sequester or whatever is coming down the pike from the federal government, that ensures the best quality of health care for your, for your communities. Yes, sir. I am going back to your former statement. I'm supposed to get an so. Yeah. Kind of a remote. Do you think, as far as the policy and having to fill out the forms and getting consent and everything is uh, predicated by the fact that, well, people do unpopular things and that's not always have unnecessary procedures and if they just open up the floodgates for telemedicine to be paid for that everybody all of a sudden will be doing telemedicine and billing unnecessarily and not getting the consents and then we get back to the same that we 
Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a balance, and um, uh, certainly the concerns that you raise are ones that uh, um, you know consumer advocacy groups and and others that are involved in the healthcare delivery system um, can be are watchdogs for. But the the benefits of telehealth greatly greatly outweigh um, those kinds of, of concerns, and you know that's always going to be there. Um, I think you know like the stories that we heard today. If, you know, if a patient, if a child or, or a, a newborn, uh, premature newborn, um, can be seen by their families, they could stay home. I mean, those are, there are thousands of examples like that where um, telehealth, uh, and I'm going to bring it back to something that's, uh, you know, where I started with this talk, and that is it's how do we build healthy communities, particularly in rural, underserved, and low-income communities. Uh, and being able to have access to the technology, that would create jobs, allow the hospitals and clinics to thrive, uh, create the opportunities for people to come, um, because if you're newly graduated and you're being sent to some small remote rural areas uh, and you're isolated from um, CME, from other professionals, um, your, your incentive for staying is not going to be very, bit, very good. But if we can create the same kinds of, of opportunity in the, in the most isolated, remote, poorest community uh, in, in the country as they have in downtown Boston, um, then I think we're going to see some real changes. So sure, there are going to be some abuses. Um, there's been questions around, uh, issues around uh, fraud and abuse. Well, Medicare is full of fraud and abuse already. So um, 